Everyday life and social scientific theory suggest that um, so much of what we do is affected by what other people are doing, whether that's uh, fashions, conventions, uh, or new innovation spreading. Um, so uh, that really the idea that what we do depends on what other people do is ubiquitous. But how much does that play a role in any given behavior? So, um, you know, when we're looking at something like students' performance in schools, how much is that actually affected by their peers in the classroom and their performance? Uh, we're looking at, you know, physical fitness or mental health um, in, you know, military recruits. How much is that affected by people in their squadron? Or even closer to this research, we're looking at the spread of information and ideas and ideology uh, online. Um, how much is that really spreading from one person to the next through an observed social network? How much is this spreading through ties on Facebook and on Twitter, as opposed to the fact that some of the people who are interested in a uh, particular ideology or particular ideas are getting that information from elsewhere, from common sources? So there's always this question uh, of, you know, how much is, you know, one person's behavior affected by, you know, their immediate set of peers, like we call those peer effects. Um, and how much is it that actually there are common external causes of both their behavior and other people's behavior? Yeah, so uh, in order to, to look at this, in order to look at how observational data might be used to tell us about causal peer effects, causal social contagion, um, we cheated a little bit. Uh, we actually had a randomized experiment. And so we're going to use this randomized experiment to benchmark the observational analysis. So we're going to say, you know, how well could this observational data do? Well, in order to get a ground truth for that, something to compare with, some kind of gold standard of what the right answer is, we actually have a randomized experiment. So um, my colleague, uh, Eitan Bakshi, and, and a couple uh, co-workers at, at Facebook ran this very interesting experiment um, in which they, they said, let's um, uh, add some additional indeterminism into the Facebook newsfeed when it comes to links. And so um, when you're on Facebook newsfeed and here we're talking about almost a decade ago now in terms of the, the design of the feed, but when you're on the feed, you're seeing content from your friends and exactly what you see is determined by a ranking algorithm that's designed to show you things that are potentially more relevant. And so this feed is somewhat non-deterministic. Um, if you share something, your friend may or may not see it because they may just not you know, keep scrolling far enough, right? People have limited attention and so they don't see everything. So in this experiment, they just added a little bit of indeterminism there. And they said, we're gonna randomly assign some people to not see some links in their newsfeed, even if their friend shares it. They randomly assigned some people to not see some links in their newsfeed. And this was a very small fraction of all pairs of people and links. So it might be that my friend uh, shares a particular New York Times article. And then if I'm randomly assigned to the no feed condition for that article, I don't see that link in my newsfeed. Now, um, my friend could still send me that link. I could still visit their profile and see that link, et cetera. But it's not right there on my homepage. Okay. So, then by looking at uh, the behavior of people who are in the no feed condition or not for some particular link, uh, we can see what the effect is of my friend sharing that link. So is, is exposure to my friend sharing the link causing me to share it? So how much contagion is actually happening? If my friend shares the link, how much more likely am I to go on to share the link? Okay. So this is this nice randomized experiment you know, very large sample sizes. We're talking about um, hundreds of millions of pairs of users and URLs and tens of millions of, of users involved in this. Um, so from that, they're able to say, you know, the answer is, you know, about seven times as likely. So, you know, if your um, friend shares a link, you're about seven times as likely to share that link if you're exposed to it in newsfeed versus not. So um, the, just the fact that your friend has shared the link, even if you don't see it in newsfeed, um, is associated 
with you being more likely to share it, right? If you read the New York Times, um, then your friends probably are more likely to read the New York Times and even more so with niche publications. So if, if I read my local uh, newspaper, it's also more likely that my friends who are more likely to live in the same area read the same local newspaper, et cetera, right? So even in the absence of exposure via newsfeed, there's a higher probability of you sharing something if your friends are sharing it, even in the absence of any social influence, social contagion, et cetera. But there is this social influence and social contagion present, and it's about seven times. Um, so I'm about as seven times as likely to, to share something if I see it in newsfeed than if I don't. So really, this randomized experiment is kind of the basis for this whole uh, study. We have this you know, solid, we might call it the gold standard or kind of a ground truth for what the causal effects are here. And then we're going to use the observational data to, com to compare with. So if you do a totally unadjusted observational study, what you're doing is taking this group that's exposed to their friend sharing a link in newsfeed and comparing them with the group that just doesn't happen to be exposed because their friends didn't share that link. Um, and if you compare those two, the rate of sharing that particular link is 30 times higher in the exposed group than in the unexposed non-experimental control group. We said earlier that the, the right answer is a little bit less than seven, okay? So that's really off, that's really quite far off. We're talking about a huge amount of bias in estimating the degree of social contagion here. This might, this if you just based your analysis on that comparison, you'd think that um, social contagion via newsfeed is much more important in what people share than it really is, okay? So that is incredibly misleading, just that simple unadjusted observational study. So that's the intuition that we had that this is going to be bad. It was bad. But really what we set out to do, the more constructive part of this was to say, what if we try to uh, adjust for a bunch of differences between the user link pairs that are exposed to a friend sharing that link and the user link pairs that aren't exposed. These people are different in some ways. Uh, these links are different. Uh, these people and link pairings are different, right? The people who have a friend who shared that link are usually inherently more interested in those type of links than the people who didn't have a friend sharing that link. Um, so what can we do to adjust there? So, you know, I think we're all familiar with the idea that you run a regression with something interesting in it. And then you say, well, why don't I run the regression with a couple more things in it? Like, let's add gender and age and in, in a lot of you know online um, platform settings you'd want to add things like how old is the user's account um, how active is this user overall are they online a lot um, how much are they just sharing links in general all those kinds of things you might want to sort of toss those into your analysis and somehow adjust for them um, so certainly we consider those kinds of adjustment sets uh, we also wanted to consider a much richer adjustment set um, ones that would make use of a longer history of people's specific behaviors. So one of the things that a priori we thought would be really useful would be uh, whether people have shared related links in the past. So if you're trying to see what's the effect of exposure to a friend sharing something on me sharing a link from TechCrunch, well, seems like a good thing to look at there and maybe to adjust for is how often I share links from TechCrunch overall, right? Am I, uh, in the past six months, how many times have I shared uh, a link that's techcrunch.com? If it's a lot, right, then that suggests I'm just sort of visiting that site anyway, right? And that might be a really valuable thing to match on. That's a potential confounder because uh, given that we expect that uh, my friend's interests and my interests are really correlated, the people who have friends who are sharing TechCrunch links are probably also more likely to be doing that themselves, right? To be sharing those links themselves because it's part of their daily browsing habits that maybe they visit that website, they're getting exposed to it through other channels. So that seems like a really useful confounder to potentially adjust for. So that was one of the ones that we had in mind. Um, that was all sort of part of the original plan. We said, these are the things that we're gonna adjust for. 
then we started talking to some other, other people who are a little bit more from a uh, statistical machine learning background. And they said, you know, uh, if you look at what recommendation systems do, they often try to work with uh, a whole matrix of the interactions between people and items. So how the winning approach to the Netflix recommendation challenge worked is that they took this big matrix of people and their ratings of movies and tried to uh, come up with some low dimensional representations of that matrix, right? So the idea there is that it's not just that my interactions with this particular category of item are relevant. My interactions with other types of items might be relevant to learning about some of my latent characteristics, dispositions, preferences, interests, whatever you want to think of them as. So um, that suggests to us that, hey, it could be useful to uh, consider uh, my sharing to all these other domains. So, so we thought it would be good to consider what are people doing with all the other domain names that are in this data set, right? So if we're looking at, at someone where the, the focal link is from the New York Times, well, maybe whether they read the Washington Post and share links from the Washington Post is actually sort of uh, predictive of their interest in general in, say, national news outlets, right? And so that's going to be a good way of controlling from, for some additional confounding due to how much people are actually reading online news or anything like that. So we also consider adjusting for this whole uh, matrix of people's past sharing to all the other domain names that are in the study. Well, we took an approach that tries to uh, deal with the fact that we have so many different things that we wanna match on, uh, so many different variables we wanna adjust for, uh, and kind of simplifies that down into actually just a single dimension that we're gonna match on. And that is the propensity score. So uh, the propensity score is the probability that a given unit is treated given all of its covariates. So I just described a whole set of variables that we could adjust for and the strategy that we used to adjust for them. Um, but in order to try to learn more from this study, we wanted to consider different possible adjustment sets. What if we adjust for all of those things I mentioned, but what if we only adjust for some of them? Um, how well would this observational study work out if we only adjust for some basic demographics, if we only adjust for how much people are using Facebook overall? Or how much does it improve if we also adjust for some of these variables that describe how much they're sharing from this domain or related domains in the past? Um, so that allows us to, instead of just giving an answer that's, you know, yes, observational causal inference works in this case, or no, observational causal inference doesn't work in this case, we can give a richer set of uh, answers that are about which variables were important to adjust for here. And that could be very cautionary if you don't measure the variables that turn out to be most important. So uh, as I mentioned, what we found in the case of the unadjusted analysis is that the unadjusted analysis was off by about 300%, right? It said that you're 30 times as likely to share something that you see a friend sharing um, when the real answer is a little bit less than seven, okay? So that's bad. Uh, does adding demographics, does adjusting for demographics and uh, some of people's basic behaviors on Facebook, does that help? Not really. It slightly reduced the bias, but not in, to an appreciable degree. Um, now, what really mattered, and this is what we had predicted uh, in advance would, would matter, was adjusting for how much people had shared links from that focal domain in the past. So if we're thinking about the New York Times, how much have you shared links from the New York Times in the past? And uh, adjusting for that variable really substantially reduced bias, right? So we cut down bias to around a tenth of the size that it was before. Uh, and that starts to give us answers that look more qualitatively similar to the answers that we're getting from the experiment. So um, they're still statistically distinguishable. Uh, we can say that the, the estimate uh, from this observational analysis adjusting for your prior sharing of that, of that domain uh, is larger than the experimental estimate. Um, so there, there is evidence of bias still there, but the, the answers are starting to get qualitatively similar, right? We're saying something like, oh, you're nine times as likely, instead of saying, oh, you're around seven times as likely. Um, and that starts to be a lot more similar in the kind of broad brushstrokes 
you know, stylized fact of how important is social contagion in what people are sharing on social media. So uh, I think that's, uh, that was encouraging. Then we said, well, what if we actually use uh, all these other domain sharing histories? So uh, you know, we're looking at the New York Times, but how much have you been sharing uh, Washington Post or Wall Street Journal, et cetera, um, and adjust for those. Doing that actually gives us observational estimates that are statistically indistinguishable from the experimental estimates. So they're still a little bit larger, but we can't statistically distinguish them. So this was actually a kind of surprising for us result. We, we went in this into this project a bit more pessimistic, right? We were thinking not only were we going to show that the naive observational analysis, not doing any adjustment was bad, but we thought that probably we were gonna show that a lot of other adjustments that you would do here were bad. And so in some ways this was quite encouraging. This said that, you know, if you are able to adjust for one relevant behavior that people have prior to the experiment, or uh, maybe a whole rich set of behaviors that they had prior to the experiment, then maybe you can actually get good estimates of pure effects from observational data. So that, that was maybe a more optimistic outlook on what you can do in terms of observational causal inference about pure effects than we had anticipated. Um, so uh, I think in summary, the, this study has a mix of optimism and caution, right? It suggests that under the right circumstances for the right types of behaviors, we can use observational data to learn about pure effects, that we can do causal inference for whether your friend is affecting you and how much, but that there are a bunch of cases where that doesn't work out so nicely. And there's a bunch of cases where you might not have measured the right things to be able to adjust for. So we had people uh, sharing history uh, by domain for six months, right? And we're adjusting for that. A lot of times you might not have something like that, that prior uh, behavior measured so precisely. So I think the big picture is that this should also uh, make people think about the design of their observational studies. If I'm going to try to do an observational study, I wanna make sure that I'm measuring these relevant confounders, the confounders that in our work turned out to be so important to reducing bias.